what a tricky year it's been. Let's have a prayer to start off with. Father in heaven, what a great God we serve. You love us so much. Um, you love us, and that's the beginning of it all. And then you take us on this journey with you, and that you transform our lives. And today I pray that you do more of your transformation right here at Walls End or wherever people are tuning in and watching from. So pour out your Holy Spirit and speak to each one of us in the way that we need to hear from you most today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to read to you a scripture, and if you've got your Bibles handy, I want you to grab it and open up to Matthew chapter 16 is our key passage today, and it's Jesus and the disciples, and I'm going to pick it up from verse 5, but really it's verse 13 where it gets super interesting. Um, It's all interesting, but anyway, you'll see. Matthew 16 and verse 5. When they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they just think, what's he on about? So they start talking amongst themselves and they discuss this among themselves and said, it's because we didn't bring any bread. <laughs> like they totally missed the point. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, uh, asked, you have little faith. Why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves that are multiplied to 5,000? How many basketfuls you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000? And how many basketfuls you gathered? How is it that you don't understand that I was not talking to you about bread? I can make it come out of thin air if I need to. Um, But be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Verse 12. Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Just tuck that thought away because we're going to come back to it later. All right, verse 13. When they came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, let me just pause for a sec. Caesarea Philippi, now we're talking about 25 kilometers away from Galilee, and they're on the outskirts of the Jewish zone, and they're getting more into a geographical region where they'll have the influence of other cultures and religions, much more Gentile flavor. And so there's um, people worshipping different gods and, and all kinds of different beliefs. And they're far from headquarters of Jerusalem where the Pharisees were really out to get Jesus. They're far from there. And Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Who do people say I am? And they replied, some say, some say you're John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Like there's a prophecy that people thought Elijah would come back. And others still... Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? So and Peter answered, you are the Messiah, son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, son Simon, son of Jonah, for this wasn't revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my, by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth, you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone he was the Messiah. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he's got to go to Jerusalem and suffer for many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Jesus is spelling it out to them. But this was so incompatible with the vision of what they thought the Messiah was going to do that it just didn't go in. There's a lesson there. I wonder if there's sometimes that Jesus is teaching truth to us, but we really just don't want to hear it and it doesn't go in. That's a sobering thought, isn't it? How can we get ourselves in a state so that that won't happen to us? Anyway, Peter took him Jesus aside. He didn't like hearing any of this and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This will never happen to you. All that persecution and death stuff. Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. That is a smackdown for Peter. (laughs) Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You don't have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Wow, straight talk. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple, as must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. And what good is it for someone if they gain the whole world but they forfeit their soul? 
And what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he'll reward each person to what, to what they've done. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here won't t- taste death before they see the Son of Man in his kingdom. There's a lot of sort of nebulous references in that short passage. What does that all mean? There's, I'm going to unpack a little bit today, and I hope you continue to wrestle and seek through this passage because it's filled with spiritual power. About a week and a half ago, I lost my car keys again. It's the second time it's ever happened, only kidding. It happens about 20 times a day with me. And so some of you might remember um, a, a year or two ago, I think we had a well service that day and Bethel, I can't remember, and I lost my keys and everybody within the church helped me and we found them, we found my keys. It was such a good moment, loved that moment. Someone says, I found them. You think, oh, what a relief. And um, this relief didn't come to me. So I, we, went, we started tracing it. What do people say to you when you lose your keys? What do they say? Where did you have them last? That's what they say, isn't it? Where did you put them last? Oh, I never thought of that. Where did I put them last? And so you think about it. And then you think, no, I did try and think of where I put them. That's the whole point. I can't remember where they are. And so I retraced it all in my mind. Friday night, I went somewhere. I think I picked up Hannah in the car. And then um, then I can't remember. And then as the day... De- well, basically... I, I genuinely, seriously lost my keys. We took Jess's car to church on Sabbath and didn't take my car, and so it was only Sunday afternoon where I knew they're properly lost. And we spent about an hour looking for them. Hannah said, let's have a prayer for it. You know, some people say, oh, I won't pray about finding my keys. It's too trivial. And I, what I'd say to you is, if I didn't pray about finding my keys, I wouldn't be here today. Um, nothing's too trivial for God. Remember the guy in the Bible, the prophet, he had an axe head fly off his axe and it was worth a lot of money to him. He'd borrowed it and it wasn't his own. And he thought, what am I going to do? Seems like a trivial thing, right? It made it into the scripture and we're talking about it thousands of years later. And the prophet Elisha says, um, he cuts a stick and he throws it in the water and the lead iron axe head floats to the surface and he says, pluck it out of the river and he goes and gets it. What a moment. That's a miracle for something trivial, people. And God cares about the big things in your life and he cares about the little things. And you've got to claim that. And part of today's message, well, I'm going to give it to you now. Um, I lost my keys and we read about the keys to the kingdom today. And I want to talk about not losing the keys that God's given us. He's given us the keys to the kingdom. He's given us a lot of things. And sometimes we've grabbed a hold of it and then we lose it. And I want to encourage us not to lose it. What happened with me was it got to Sunday night. We'd prayed, no keys. We'd searched everywhere. Monday came around and I've got a problem, okay? So Jess said, well, get the spare key. I said, I took it off your key ring a few weeks ago and I've lost it. And so now I had lost the spare key and my keys and they have the church keys on them, keys to the school, keys to the gym, keys to the car. And so this is a bad thing to lose this bunch of keys. And so um, Sunday goes by, Monday goes by. On Sunday we had a house inspection. We're trying to sell our house for our big move to Coffs and they should have showed up. The house is cleaner than it's ever going to get and the keys are still not found. And so um, the days are rolling by and I was thinking, this is terrible. I went to the gym and got a new key to the front door of the gym and I thought, at what point, God, do I pay thousands of dollars and get a new lock for my car, for the ignition for my car? This is getting terrible. And um, about three days later, Jess comes to me in the evening and says, look what I've got. She had the keys in her hand. "You You want to know where they were? They were in the medicine basket up in the, up in the cupboard. And so the med- someone had put the medicine basket down, put the keys in the medicine basket, and then in our cleanup up in the cupboard they had gone. Okay, so here's where I'm even more of an idiot. My brother's a thoughtful guy, and he gives the best presents. And about a year ago, Brad bought me a special expensive tile that rings when you... Um, when you lose your keys. 
Well, I lost it. <laughs> I lost it before I had a chance to put it on my keys. <laughs> and I felt so embarrassed and ashamed that I haven't told you until this moment. <laughs> so I said to it, Jess knows, my family knows, that we've all been looking for the tile for one year. And we, it, we haven't found it. And so I said to Jess, I don't care. As soon as I get those keys back, I'm going to JB Hi-Fi and I'm buying one of those tiles. And so I've got one now. Check it out. Plays a little tune. And uh, it, I've used it about 20 times already. And it, it's just great. In fact, just yesterday, I was rushing out the door to go and I said, Jess, where's my keys? And I thought, hang on a minute. And I play, activated it with my phone. And I could hear the keys ringing right near me. And I was spinning around. And then I realized, oh, it's in my pocket. <laughs> so look, the good news is I'm off to Coffs Harbor. And you've got a much more competent pastor who's going to be looking after the church <laughs> from this point forward. So if people from Coffs are watching today, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> that's just how the cookie has crumbled. And so we can, the funny thing about losing your keys is, for as often as I've done it, I hate doing it, and I've never meant to do it. And yet I've still lost them. And this happens with our walk with Jesus. I don't know of any Christian who's given their heart to the Lord who says to themselves, I'm going to try and lose my walk with the Lord. It never happens. But people lose their faith all the time. And um, it's a discouraging and sobering thing to look at the statistics of those who've given their heart to Jesus and then those who fall away. And Jesus gives us a whole parable about it. It's actually something that he knows happens in the human condition. And there's a parable in your Bible in Matthew chapter 13 about losing your faith. And so you can look it up with me. It's the parable of the sower. And you've heard it before, but in the context of today's message of don't lose the keys to the kingdom, just listen to this. Um, Matthew chapter 13, verse 1. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such a large crowd gathered there that he got into a boat and sat in it, and all the people stood on the shore. And then he told them many things in parables. And he said, a farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he was scattering seed, some fell along the path. And the birds came and ate it up. And some fell on the rocky places where it didn't have much soil and sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Everybody say, no root. No root. The seed fell, other seed fell among the thorns. Everybody say, thorns. Thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. And still others fell on good soil. Everybody say, good soil good soil, where it produced a crop, 100, 60 or 30 times what was sown. And then there's, we're going to skip down, and it says in verse 18, listen to what this parable of the sower means, verse 19. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and doesn't understand it, everybody say understand, understand, then the evil one, that's Satan, comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. That's the first group of people who lose their faith. They never really understood it in the first place. They've just heard the message, but they didn't understand it. There's a, there a lack of understanding. This seed is the, sown, the one sown on the path. Now, here's the one from the rocky ground, verse 20. It refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. Can you think of people? It's a sad thing, but I can think of people who were thrilled to become Christians. Christians. But then, verse 21, since they have no root, it only lasts a short time. That's the sad bit, that it only lasts a short time. And it's kind of like a fireworks. The, the sky is dark and then it lights up with a beautiful, beautiful display. But then moments later, it's out again and it's dark again. Instead of staying the light of the world, it was just the light of the world just for a brief moment. And when, what, what put it out so quick? Okay, here's one of the reasons why people lose their faith. They lose the keys to the kingdom. When trouble or persecution because of the word come, they quickly fall away. Do we experience persecution or trouble because of our belief in Jesus in, here in Australia? It's a kind of a relative sort of a question, isn't it? And it's a personal sort of a question. But the facts are, in different ways, like it's not a competition. We know that there's plenty of people who have it far, far worse than us in other countries where it's illegal to be a Christian or people are outright um, regularly hassled. But there are things that make it difficult. In fact, 
It could just be your own family who don't believe in God hassling you for your faith in Jesus. Or it could be your workmates, your workplace, who make it difficult for you because they know you believe something and they don't like it. And you know what? In a country where we have freedom of religion, the enemy, the devil, finds a way to still give us a hard time for following Jesus. And it's a real reality. And I do not want to diminish the problems and the challenges that we have here in Australia. I don't want to, it's not a competition. People getting thrown in prison or worse in other countries um, doesn't take away from the fact that there can be incredible peer pressure or difficulty because of our faith. And kids at school, um, you know what I'm talking about. Um, it's just great to fit in at school and be part of the mainstream. And sometimes the mainstream's with Jesus, and sometimes it isn't. And you've got a test in that moment. And Jesus says that this is a real thing. It's made it into the Bible. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, some people fall away quickly. And that's a real reality. And um, let's look at the next one. The seed fell among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it out, making it unfruitful. This one here I feel like is relevant for those of us who have been believers for a long period of time. And I think that this is a constant battle for the for the long-term believer. In a garden, weeds pop up all the time. How, who's sort of astonished at the, you spray the weeds with poison if you're one of those people who'll take the risk and you, you think, that's got them. And then they turn brown and you think, yeah, progress. And it's going to take ages before they grow back. But about two weeks later, you see the little green things coming up again. And you think, give me a break. I just risked the poison only two weeks ago. <laughs> and, and here they are growing back again. And this is what it's like in our spiritual life because it's not a one challenge to our faith with God. The devil doesn't just rest. Um, we've had challenges in our faith. All of us have. And if you've been in the church for 20 years, then you've had 20 years of challenges to your faith. And these weeds grow up. Now, other version, this version says, what does it represent, the weeds? It says, the deceitfulness of wealth so that's the lie that money is going to be what you really need. Um, and then what else does it say? The worries of this life. Another version says the busyness of life. Look, people who lose their keys don't do it on purpose. Um, people who lose their faith, they're not doing that on purpose. Something's gotten in there and just gotten in the way of it. And I think busyness is like the devil's like best machine gun against the Adventist church in our world. It's just relentless. And we just, we get more machines to do our work for us and we're just still more busy. I don't know how it works. Like we're just, and our minds are constantly taken up. And so we, we just don't find out we have time for God and he's just slowly drifting or we're drifting from him. And it happens to the best of us, not on purpose, and we find that we might have lost the keys and we need to try and find them again, the keys to the kingdom. Where are they? I've lost the keys and we need to go looking for them. Um, the lie of money is, a, in, you know, money is an interesting thing. It's absolutely fantastic for what money is good at. We're trying to sell our house right now. I hope we get lots of money for it. We won't, but I just hope that we do. Why? Because I want to buy another house. I've got to live somewhere. And money's not evil, is it? It's just a thing. But it becomes a problem when we start thinking that money's going to do for us what only God can do. And that's really the, really the issue. And God just, did you know there's more verses in the Bible about money than there are about heaven and hell combined? There's a lot of teaching in the Bible about money. Because it's a really important part of life and it's really important that we understand it right and keep it as a servant rather than as a master. And so long as money is our servant, no problemo. As soon as money becomes our master, we're in trouble. We've lost the keys to the kingdom for a moment. We've got to go searching for them again. Listen, I just think it's so easy. I've found it a struggle as a pastor and um, for money to take a special place in my mind and heart. And what's it doing there? I need to remember who's the, who's the giver of all things. Money's not going to save me. I need it, but it is just a tool. 
what I really need most is the Father. He's going to be my provider. It's important to work for money. Um, I don't think that it's right for the Christian to just say, oh, God's going to look after me. He'll take care of everything. I'm just going to do nothing. That's ridiculous. The Bible says that God will bless the work of your hands and multiply it. We've got to work to start with for him to bring the blessing. And so there's all kinds of teaching on money in the scripture, but there's all kinds of warning that as good as it is and as helpful as it is to make the world a better place, it can be our spiritual undoing because we can, it's so good that we can start to think that it's God. And friends today, maybe that's the message to you. Whether you've got a little or you've got a lot, remember that this is just a tool and what you really need is the one who's the, the keeper of time itself, the maker of the heaven and the earth. And he's the one who can take care of all of our needs and that's what's giving me peace as we're in a tricky transition time of selling a house, buying a new one. You know, it's easy to get stressed, but I just got to remind myself, you know, I'm in God's hands. He's the one who's going to look after me. He's going to get me through. He hasn't failed me before. I don't think he's going to start failing me now. I've got to just keep that in my mind. So these things come out and choke out our spiritual life and they threaten us with the prospect of us losing the keys to the kingdom. You know, I've been using this phrase, the keys of the kingdom. And what, what is the key to the kingdom? The key to the kingdom is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's, it's the message that tells us that while we were but sinners, Christ died for us. And so this is what you read when you look at the first chapters of the book of Romans, that we all find ourselves in trouble because we're sinners. But Jesus loves us while we're still sinners. You don't get yourself good enough and then come to God. He comes to you while you're still broken in your sin. Some of us think, I don't know if I could set foot back in church after I'm sort of ashamed and embarrassed of where I've been. And God says, That's, you're who I've made church for. Come through those doors. And he, God is saying, come to me. And so what's the, what's the keys to the kingdom? The keys to the kingdom is Jesus Christ himself. He's the one who said, I am the key to the kingdom. When he stretched out his arms on the cross, he's taking in one hand a broken human and in the other hand, God's righteousness and perfection and he's, his strength is holding them together. His sacrifice is holding them together. And so it's what Jesus did for us is the key to the kingdom. And so we can lose that grip on Jesus. How does it happen? Well, we've just looked at it. By accident, by cherishing sin, by busyness, by loving money, through persecution, through not driving your roots down deep into Jesus. Um, you know, there's another key in the Bible that um, is spoken of in um, Luke 11:52, And it says this, Woe to you, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees, woe to you experts in the law. This is shocking. Because you have taken away the key of knowledge, you yourselves have not entered, and you've hindered those who are entering. So this is what Jesus is telling off the Pharisees. He's saying, you guys had the keys to knowledge of the gospel. And he says, you've somehow messed it up for yourself. You yourselves haven't stepped into a saving relationship with Jesus. What's more, you've so twisted this religious message that it stopped everyone else from getting in as well. And that's why Jesus had to do a complete rehash and overturn of the religious system that was set up at that time because it had become a stale reflection of the truth of what it was meant to be. But it was, there was enough of the power of God in the gospel, even in the twisted, messed up version, that you had beautiful goings on in the hearts of some of the toughest Pharisees and Sadducees and so forth. And so that's how you get the story of someone like Nicodemus, who's, who's one of these most religious guys, and, and he came to Jesus at night because he was too embarrassed through the social implications of a, a public meeting with Jesus, and it began a connection with him. And we know that from um, church history that Nicodemus actually gave his heart to Jesus and became an important leader in the church. And he wasn't the only one. You know, as we look into church history, and you can read about it in the Desire of Ages, that um, you know how 3,000 people gave their hearts to Jesus when Peter got up and preached that day in Acts chapter 2? Many of those people had heard Jesus' teaching. Many of them. And many of them were priests and church leaders, religious leaders. And at that time, some of these people who had had hard hearts toward Jesus, it was a breakthrough. And they realized 
He's the one we've been looking for. I believe it. And the Holy Spirit came upon them. So what's this? It's, it's similar to the first one, but this second reference to the key that we could lose is the key to the truth, the key to knowledge. You know, the Bible says that put on the full armor of God, and one of the elements of the full armor of God is the truth, the belt of truth. You know, as a Seventh Adventist church, I believe God's entrusted us with a beautiful end time message. It was so um, encouraging to go through the Bible teachings that we have with Jackson in preparation for his baptism this morning. And every time I do it, I get blessed um, because I get a refresher. I, I don't know how often I would do it if I didn't have to do it to lead someone to Jesus and in prepare, preparation for their baptism. But I do it quite frequently, and I get the blessing every time. How come? Because there's power in the living Word of God. Every time you open up the Bible and you say, God, speak to me, and you review what we believe, it strengthens your faith. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. And Jesus says, I am the living Word. When you open up the Bible and you say, God, I've got a soft heart towards you, speak to me, God is going to strengthen your faith. And today, at the end of 2020, I'm giving you an appeal. Wherever you're watching, in Hall 1, here in church, at home, pick up your Bible again. Get into the Word of God. Restart a habit to read a chapter or two every day. First thing in the morning, it'll take you five minutes to read one chapter. Open your heart to God and say, God, what are you speaking to me through this? If you do three chapters a day, you'll read the whole Bible in a year. If you've never read the whole Bible, make 2021 the year. I'm going to read through the whole scripture. You don't have to understand everything as you go. You can have a little notebook and you, and you can just put questions as you're going. Did you know in Deuteronomy it says, it's the privilege of a human being to seek out the things of God. This is one of our purposes, to try and figure out who he is and understand more about him. And so that's driving your roots down deep into Jesus, saying, I'm going to try and spend time with you. I'm going to try and connect with you. I want to fill my mind with the living word. And so doing that, getting hold of that knowledge and reviewing what we believe as a church is a beautiful thing. You know, the next time the church offers a program where they say, we're going to teach um, our our, our beliefs in a series. Sign up for it and say, I haven't done this for 20 years, or I haven't done this for two years. I want to hear the Word of God taught again. I want to do it for my own blessing and enrichment. You know, there's another thing that's mentioned here, a third thing that I want to end with. And um, I'm going to read it again, this little passage here. Jesus says, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That is power that he's talking about right there. And I believe that we lose the keys of power all the time. In fact, I'm worried that we lost them like I did days ago, and we haven't even noticed they're lost yet. Someone's put the keys to the kingdom of God's power in the medicine basket. It's gone up on the top shelf, and the door's shut, and you don't even know that it's missing. And when you do look for it, you don't know how to find it. Because every now and again, we actually want the power of God to show up, but we haven't been using his power. We haven't been leaning on his power. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2 that in the last days, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all people, young, old, men, women, boys and girls. I'm going to give them spiritual dreams. I'm going to give them authority. Jesus says that I'm going to give out my spirit's power in such a way that people will do even greater things than I have done. When do we believe this will be fulfilled as a church? When do we think that's going to happen? And we, we often refer to it, well, in the last days this will happen. Did you know that we, it's available now? You know, Ellen White said, people refer to this great outpouring of the Holy Spirit as if it's available sometime in the future. She said, it's available now. When did she write that? Over 100 years ago she wrote that. Friends, I want to encourage you Pick up your Bible. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where it says that God has a spiritual gift of power for everyone. It doesn't say God's got a talent for everyone. That's true too. But in 1 Corinthians 12, it says he's got a gift of power. It's a prophetic message, or it's a gift of healing. There's many gifts of power listed there that are over and above our human talents. And God is saying, if you don't have these, you're like a body with a part that's missing. And I think that we see flashes of brilliance every so often. 
and it's God's power at work. It's, it's here among us, but I just think it's meant to be like times 10, times 50, what we've, what we've kind of gotten used to. We've gotten used to having the keys missing. And so I went out and got my little tile beeper, and now if I press on it, plays a little tune and it'll help me find my phone because I'll lose that too. If I can just have one of them, I'm going to be all right. It'll help me find the other one. And so we need to put things in our life so that when we lose the keys to the kingdom, whether it's the message and we've drifted from the great Adventist message we've been entrusted with or the keys to the kingdom in terms of our very faith itself or the keys to the Holy Spirit's power, the authority that has been bestowed upon, upon us, that we can find it again quickly. And so what are some of the secrets? I've got this little trick now. I'm just not trusting myself to be smart enough to ever just do the right thing and put my key in the key basket every time. Um, I'm just, I just know myself. I can't trust myself with that. And there's a little bit of humility that helps in life. And if we know that we've got a tendency to drift spiritually one way or the other, it's time for us to figure out our personalised little tile to put in our lives. And so here's some of the things that we can do in our lives so that we won't drift too far. And I'm pretty sure you're doing some of them already because you're here at church on Sabbath. The ones who have drifted so far, they're, um, they're not tuning in, they're not connecting anymore. And so here's one of the things. Be in fellowship with other believers. The more frequently and the more regularly and committed you are to meeting with other believers, the Bible says meet together more and more as you see the day approaching. That's one little thing that's going to be like this little tile that you're not going to be able to go too far without losing uh, and, and lose your keys to the kingdom um, if you're regularly meeting with other believers. Now, it is possible, but you're drastically reducing the odds of having your spiritual life just go stale into nothing if you're regularly with other believers. Now, some of us, it can happen. It happened with the Pharisees, but I'm telling you, if you are on your own spiritually, and if you've said to yourself, I don't really need other believers, I can just do it all on my own, you're missing like, I don't know, 75% of what spiritual journey is all about by isolating yourself. And we're all different personalities, and some of us find it harder than others to connect with other people. But the Bible says that Jesus says, I'm the head of the body, and you, each one, is a part of it. And we only fulfill our purpose in life when we come together as a community. That's one of the little tile tricks that you can get. Another one is to actually share your faith in Jesus with others. When you think to yourself, God, use me. Today, use me. This week, use me. God, in 2021, I want you to use me to help share the gospel with someone at work or someone in my neighborhood or somebody in our community or one of my relatives who I know and love. Use me, Jesus. When you take that stance, it's very difficult to fade away from the keys of the kingdom. In fact, you're grabbing a hold of the keys at that point because you, you realize in a flash, I'm unable to do this. I need God's help to do this. If this is going to be effectual at all, it's going to have to be Jesus who shows up. And we grab a hold of the, the, the authority that he's given us because we realize I don't have anything else. And so when we are active in sharing our faith, it's like having one of these little tiles. In fact, the, the Bible says it like this. Paul writes it to Timothy, and it's a very interesting verse. It could be misunderstood, but don't misunderstand it. 1 Timothy 4.16, Watch your life and doctrine closely, persevere in them because if you do you'll save both yourself and your hearers now we're not saved by our actions but what he's saying is when you're active in sharing your faith you're you're in a safe position spiritually because you're just close to me you can't drift off from me and have a meaningful experience of sharing the faith um, it's a it's a little safeguard around your own um, your own spiritual journey so what are, the, what are the little tiles? Well, one of them is to share our faith. Another one is to meet with other believers. And another one, which Walls End Church is so good at, is serving. Serving in our community. 
making space in your life to do a kind deed for someone else, whether it's filling a gift basket of some sort for someone in our church or community, or if it's volunteering time in our church, if it's volunteering in some other ministry or charity in the community, um, if it's making a difference to make this world a better place. When you say, I'm going to put my own needs and priorities to the side, and I'm going to spend some of my precious limited resources to serve our community to make this world a better place, God is in that. And as you engage in serving our community, God brings his spirit into you. He, he's alongside of you and he makes breakthroughs happen. You know, God has got his power with your name on it. Um, I wonder what keys you might need to go looking for. Is it the keys to your own faith itself? Is it keys to the message that you've maybe gotten rusty on? Is it keys to the authority that's given us through the power of Jesus? Whatever the keys that you've, you might be needing to look for today, I want to pray for you. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Father in heaven, some of us have lost the keys to the kingdom. We've had them in the past, we were close to you, and we've drifted off, and we don't know what happened, and we want them back. And Father, please be our saviour. Forgive our sins. Be the Lord and King of our lives again. If there's something hindering us, a sin in our life that we can't deal with on our own, that's no problem for you. I pray that you, Jesus, would come into our lives and, re and give us a breakthrough in those areas that we need it. Whatever it is, whether it's busyness, um, worries of life, um, money, or anything that is become a God to us instead of you, Whatever might be stopping us from being close to you, I pray in Jesus' name that you'd give us a breakthrough in that area. Some of us have forgotten the power and the beauty of the gospel and the full end-time message that you've entrusted us as a church. Help us to get back into your word and read your scripture and have our life enriched daily with the powerful word of the living God. Father, um, some of us have hardly scratch the surface of the power that you offer us through Jesus and, the, and what you've, you've opened up to us and you've bestowed upon us the spirit for your end time work. I pray that you would unlock new um, power of God in our church and community for everyone listening so that we can lift up your name, Jesus, and see amazing things happen to strengthen your kingdom. Um, Lord, we, we long to see that happen in preparation for your coming. Pour out your spirit, Lord. If we've lost the keys, help us to find them. If we've never discovered them, I pray that you'd open our hearts and minds to them today and that we'd take that important step with you. And we're praying this all together in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends,